physics video production comments first <laughs> so we can make these into subjects though what the hell um, so uh, just as a preface I mean you know these these dismissive naysaying bullshitters that's all you people seem to have um, <clears throat> you know the analogy between you know the creationist, the religious kooks uh, at the time of Darwin. You, you ha there's a perfect correlation. I mean, you you think you're so much better than you know um, those people. You know those closed-minded, um, arrogant, um, ignorant, stupid people. You know who rejected a theory that first they couldn't care to read the book. <laughs> um, and they couldn't care to deal with anything actually said, you know, instead they had to do things like, we ain't related to no minkies, you know, and think they're clever, and that's the extent of their argument, and it's pitiful, and you're pitiful, um, you know, you think you're so smart, and yet you're behaving as if, you know, you're not so smart, because these aren't even close to reasonable um, objections, anyway. So a mirror strapped to my ass is an anti-gravity device. Awesome. The truth is, in a sense, yes. The answer is yes. It's not my fault it's that simple. But yeah, it, is. it just turns out that it's that simple, really. And you can see it in lots of different ways. Um, <clears throat> you could argue that um, uh, when those mag left trains, you know, the trains that lift themselves up to float on magnetism, are basically mirroring the magnetism, okay? I mean, the, the train has got a, a certain, you know, polarity, let's just say, and it it's essentially creating the same polarity in a hunk of, let's say, aluminum. So it's running a, a magnet across the aluminum, and the fact is, is that it's taking advantage of the fact that the same polarity is being created on the surface of the aluminum that this thing has. And the trick is, this has to be moving. Okay, and that's it. You move this, okay, and this will respond by creating more magnetism, and you'll float on it. And it's basically just a reflection. Now, I've illustrated the protons and the electrons function is basically just having mirrors sensitive to two different kinds of light. So you could argue that one, you have one mirror that reflects blue light, and you have one mirror that reflects red light. And so you send in a bunch of mixed light into these uh, objects, and what will happen is the red stuff will reflect off of the red, the thing that has the red mirror, and the blue stuff will reflect off the thing that has a blue mirror. And that little simple fact, you know, if I just made it that way, um, makes this, these things capable of filtering what comes in and creating something different that comes out. And, you know, that's what charge is. It perfectly fits, it explains the mechanism, and yet you're playing this game. So anyway, back to this analogy. Um, so, so what you're basically saying is, is that in a sense, okay, if I, let's, let's you know, here, I, well, I'll explain a little bit to you, okay, of what's happening to, um, uh, you know, uh, atoms on the surface of the aluminum. And the atoms are when when the magnetism force the reflection okay comes down uh, it's basically converting it's just basically saying I uh, uh, red pressure so it's it's affecting the thing with the same pressure and it's polarizing the atom so it changes the atom into a, a, a positive atom you could argue okay we'll just use that for this example um, but the trick is it's a conductor but it takes a while for the conducting to happen so if you have a bunch of these atoms you know we have a whole row of them oh, okay I'll try to explain this now if I just put the the force okay in one place and I said change these atoms well it would affect these atoms here and so it would change these okay but it's going to take time for the conductor to change them back. And the conductor is going to do that. The conductor is going to make an exchange, okay, and it's going to 
take this one and turn it from blue back to red again, you know, in time. It takes a little bit of time. And the key is, is that you keep radiating it here. But it doesn't do you any good. Once this turns red, hitting it with more red doesn't do you any good. You're not gonna get anywhere. You're not nothing's gonna happen. So you're wasting your red. You're throwing it away in a sense. And what you really want to do is move this thing so you can make more atoms red. Okay? So if it was a real LED, let's say a light, and you want to absorb as much as the light as possible. Well, it doesn't do you any good to keep it in one place because of this time problem. The, the fact that this electricity, this transition... Uh, speaker's making noise. Yeah, computers. Yeah, the guy working on the simulation is computer fried. <laughs> so, it'll be a couple more days. Um, hopefully, not because of the simulation. Uh, but anyway, you know, it's just such a, you know, my, my folder, my document folder disappeared. I mean, it's, you know, computers. Anyway, so you can sort of understand that if this takes time to happen, this exchange and this movement of this current, that if I wanted to collect as many as possible, if I wanted to make these rays mean as much as possible, I want to move this thing to new locations so it can, you know, energize more atoms and cause more of this effect. So I'm, I'm going to increase the amount of reflection I get by creating these mirrors, you know, by converting the mirror into the opposite mirror of me, all right? And, and so if I want to do that, I need to move this thing so it affects more density of the atoms. If I leave it in one place, it's not going to hit as many atoms. And it's not going to affect as, it's not going to create as many transitions, as many transitions from blue, from blue to red, you know. The, the number of transitions, conversions of the atom, the, the distortion of the atom, the number of distortions in the atoms. So I never want a photon to hit it, and then another one to hit it, and another one to hit it, and another one to hit it before it can transition. I want to spread these photons onto as many atoms as possible to get the maximum amount of reflection back to make as much red mirror as possible. So the only way it works is moving it. So you move the train, you move the big magnet, the reflection increases because you're covering more atoms, you're hitting more atoms, you're making more conversions, you get more magnetism back and eventually you get enough to lift the fucking train. Now, there's a real principle. It can be explained by mirrors, yes. And so, if you wanted to be anti-gravity, okay, so you, you say you want an anti-gravity mirror, but, um, yeah, it's theoretically possible, but understand your challenge, okay? Your, your challenge is, is, is gravity ends up being both fields, all right? It's not polarized. It's not... Uh, it's all it's made of charge as I pointed out. It's made out of electrons and protons But it's mixed. Okay, so the field is mixed So you've got a little red uh, atom and you got a little blue atom and you got a red atom and you got a blue atom And you got them all mixed up in there and if you want anti-gravity Well, what you have to do is you have to create a mirror. Okay, that's exactly the same as the field coming at you and that field's constantly changing one ray goes from being blue to red to you know, through time, the rays of force and their position in space is going to be constantly changing. So your mirror has to constantly change from this spot being a blue spot to this spot being a red spot, depending on what's coming in. But if you could make such a mirror, that is, if you could take your electrons and protons and you could move them, okay, to where the force is, so I could put my red one here and I could put my blue one here, <coughs> and I could put my red one here and blue, blue... If I could do that, then it would work. You could make an anti-gravity mirror. Shithead. <clears throat> idiot. <laughs> and you are an idiot. You're just as big an idiot as the, the evolution deniers. I'm giving you the better answer to the question. How did we get here, right? 
is the same as Darwin. He comes up with a nice, simple, mechanical explanation for our existence. No gods needed, no woo, no neutrinos, no entanglement, no bent fucking space bullshit. Um, you know, no time as a dimension nonsense. And um, you're just rejecting it because you're, you're committed to your religion. Okay, awesome. Um, and an object's size, not its mass, is what determines how much pushing force affects me when facing the object. So clearly in the video, I said the word opaque, right? I said it, right? An opaque, a, a, a substance opacency is much like mass, right? I mean, something, you can imagine that something like, uh, you know, semi-transparent, a, a clear thing, uh, you know, a piece of glass that doesn't have much dirt in it. And we have a piece of glass with a lot of dirt in it. Uh, right? You can, you can understand that um, uh, those two things, you can understand the difference, you know, colored glass versus clear glass, right? And, and you understand what the difference is, is these little particles that are going to be uh, obstructive in some way or another. And that's, you can analogize that perfectly to you know, what's the difference between these things? Well, it's like a feather. This is like a feather. Very few obstructions to the light. And this one is like the lead ball. A lot of obstructions to the light, right? And so that's mass. Mass in, in, a, in, a, uh, in an optics sense would be much like your opacity, right? How much light you'll absorb depends on how opaque you are. If you're not very opaque, then the stuff goes through you. If you're opaque, uh, the stuff doesn't go through you. You interact with it. And the same is true for these forces of gravity. Gravity works because it moves electrons and protons. The number of the protons and electrons define mass. They are mass, okay? You count those fucking things and you know how much mass there is. Asshole. I made that so frickin' clear. So why would you put these words in my mouth? And an object size, not its mass. Where did I say anything about the object size except the fact that I have to make a drawing, okay? <laughs> I'm making a drawing, and I put two objects in the, in, in the drawing. Now, where, where have I made any statement that, no, well, this one is translucent, and this one is opaque or something? I didn't say anything like that. The assumption is that they have they have the same solidity. Okay, <laughs> there's no bullshit here, and and you can see this the the fact that density matters in things like the sun. Okay, I mean you got the sun here and you got this little tiny Earth, and those proportions are about right. Okay, that's their difference in size, um, but the density of the sun is, you know, the the things are so far apart. And the density of the Earth is so different. And so on the surface of the Sun, there's only eight times as much gravity as there is on Earth. So even though the Sun's one million times bigger, right, in size, its density is a million times less in a sense. I mean, not a million, so eight divided into a million. So it's 30,000 times less dense than the Earth is. And so you only have eight times the gravity on the surface of the Sun. You know, million times bigger so it's but the sun is huge it's a million times bigger so even though they're the little elements are further apart it's still going to be very opaque okay to a light trying to go through it this has to go through a whole bunch of of density of crap and yes the gravity on the earth the earth is like i said it's <laughs> on its surface it's good creating some gravity that's pretty substantial and all that crap but by comparison it's not it doesn't catch any of this force I mean so you know none of this gets caught at all uh, so its density is is horrible you know in terms of spatially but if it does if something does go through it it's more likely to get blocked by an earth um, because of the fact that the the atoms are so uh, full of electrons and protons where the atoms here have very few electrons and protons but anyway, I made it clear. So, you know, you, what you can't, you can't handle the word opaque. You can't understand it as a concept. And again, I never made any size comparisons. I talked about 
how the shadow gets deeper the more mass you have. I said these things in the video and look what you're doing. Look at how you're distorted what I said. And that's the best you can do, right? You, you can't make an honest argument. You can't directly quote me, uh, you know, to, to do this, whatever this is, this nonsense. <laughs> you know, so fuck you. Try again, loser. I mean, you've overtly mischaracterized what I said. You've overtly pretended you can't handle the concept of opaque. It's too, too bizarre a concept for you. you. You can't figure out what that means. I mean, you've demonstrated you're an asshole and an idiot. Bravo. So, another comment by the same idiot. <clears throat> uh, is the pushing force, uh, electrons and protons, a constant predictable pressure? Depending on the circumstances. I mean, I spell it out as clearly as you can spell it out. I mean, I, I, can't, I can't make it any more ABC block for you. You're this fucking stupid. So, I mean, I, I pointed out that there's empty space, right? And that there's this force out there, like the cosmic background radiation, just like that. Except, you know, the cosmic background radiation is made out of, oh, well, this is a microwave wave, okay? A wave of microwaves. No, nah, it's not a wave, but regardless. And it, but it has a certain components to it. It has, it, we can only see it if, if, it goes bip, 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 bip. If it only goes bip, bip, we don't see it. So there's lots of microwaves out there that just don't have any ray lengths. There's a minimum ray length. Can you understand that? That, you know, our eyes only see photons that have a, a ray length with six components in it. And that we can make devices that can see, you know, four components. But the trick is, guess what happens when we try to make it more sensitive? It sees light everywhere, right? So we, well, we make it so it can see light that only has four components or three components. All of a sudden, it doesn't matter where we point the fucking thing. It's all over the place, the photons. It just goes blip, blip, and photon, 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 photon. It goes crazy, and we think it's broken. No, it's not broken. It's, it's seeing actual shit. Um, it's just that that's the shit that gets through. That's the shit that goes right through things because that ray, okay doesn't do enough damage to the electron. It doesn't push the electron far enough out of its uh, orbit to, to create the, uh, uh, the response that would consume the momentum uh, of the photon. Uh, so it makes it through. But So you could understand that, right? That's not hard to understand. There's this cosmic background radiation and we, could, we can figure out that, you know what? If, we, if our detectors miss stuff, you know, they don't detect it. You know, we can't see it all. Just like our eyes is kind of feeble, right? And you, you can maybe logically know that if I made microwaves visible and I made radio waves visible, uh, rays, if I made all that stuff visible, that this room would be incredibly bright. You might be able to understand that, right? That I would so magnify the number of photons my eyes are seeing if I made the whole spectrum visible. And that's only a portion of the stuff we're missing. Because again, the point is, is that there's not only the frequency problem with our detection, that we can only detect things that have a frequency, but it's the length of the frequency, that there has to be a certain ray length, or we don't see it. We can't detect it. So. Anything that has a mixed frequency, that is, it comes in two things this far away and then one thing that far away and two things this far away. Mixed frequency, we don't see it. We can't detect it. Not enough of that, not enough of that, not enough of this. Um, <clears throat> so there could be a ton of energy out there that we just can't see. Uh, and so, um, so uh, anyway, I made the point. Look, we start off with a, a universe and we just say, yeah, it's full of this crap. And the indication is from the cosmic background radiation that it's even crap. There's much, there's much crap coming from over there. Is it coming from over there? It's come from over there. That's what the evidence indicates. And my simple point was, is if I put two things in that crap, okay, um, now it will be uneven. So you ask this stupid question. 
well, uh, is the pushing force, electrons and protons, well, they're not the pushing force, asshole, they're the things being pushed, um, a constant predictable pressure. Well, it's predictable in the sense that I know that if I put two things here, this straight line force and this straight line force and this straight line force isn't going to hit this surface and this straight line force and this straight line and this straight line force isn't going to hit this surface. So I know that this surface isn't going to get hit with something, and I know this surface isn't going to get hit with something. That's what I explained. So yes, it can get uneven. Uh, so, But yes, predictable it is. So no, it's not constant in the sense that as soon as there's more than one thing in the universe, it's not constant. Okay, it is constant in the sense that the force itself is constant, but these things, having more than one electron in the universe or more than one proton in the universe, means that the universe is going to change in this local environment. It's just a fact. The universe here will not be the universe here. Those two universes will not be the same. Made this clear. Okay, if not, why do objects fall towards larger objects with a consistent predictable speed and acceleration? So he keeps throwing all these words together like they're the same word like consistent and predictable are the same word. They're not the same word. So, more crap. Yes, they behave consistently. The same rules always apply. All right, so no problem there. Uh, there's a perfect consistency, see. And yes, it's predictable, but it's not the same, okay? <laughs> um, but the reason why it's the same is, well, part of, there's lots of reasons, but, I mean, obviously it's just a numbers game. You just add up the number of electrons, and you know how much force or, or opacity you have for a given area, and that matters. So if, if, if gravity um, didn't have certain rules, that is, like, once you gain a certain size, the force on you becomes strong enough to crush material shapes. It will crush them and force them to do this flat thing. So yes, there is a flat Earth, but there's a flat Earth <laughs> every picometer of, of space on Earth, okay? It's flat, but it's only flat for a little tiny bit. Uh, and. Um, Everything's made flat by the fact that there's a pretty substantial pressure smashing it into the ground. Um, and everything turns spherical. So that's why the rules get really simple. But the fact is, is that on the subatomic level, you can create things that are, have lots of mountains on them. You can create objects that have charge, and you can put little funky things on the charge. Right? I can have a charged object, and then I, <coughs> and I can... Um, I can completely change the uh, potential, okay, across this field by just having some irregularities. And I'll guarantee that this here, this is where the spark is going to be, right here. This is where it will happen. Um, so I'll change, I'll create a very inconsistent gravitational pattern in the sense that the charge pattern, there'll be a lot of force here and less force here uh, because I've changed where the mass is. I've changed its profile. Um, and so you could have objects in space like uh, asteroids that haven't created enough gravity yet so they're kind of lumpy you know and funny shaped and they can bang into each other and they can actually stick you know, create indentations in each other because they're not going fast enough to smash each other. So they smash into each other a little bit and just kind of impress upon each other. And then some little rock hits over here and breaks it loose and it leaves a scar on the other thing. All right. But there's still dust collecting, you know, to the, on the surfaces. They're still collecting dust. And it's, you know, it's changing its shape, but the fact is that if this thing was a mile across, let's say, I could go across that mile and measure gravity, and I'd find out that the gravity increases where this mass increases. So where there's more mass, there's going to be more gravity, and there'll be less gravity here. All right, these are all subtle things to measure, but it can be measured. Uh, I think NASA's already done it. There's a difference in the gravity through, say, this line, 
okay the something testing gravity here and testing gravity here would find more gravity across the length than they're going to find across the width um, and so again the mathematics gets very consistent and very easy merely because on the big scale um, all of these objects end up having spherical symmetry they all end up becoming pretty close to perfect spheres and so that means their profile of radiation will be completely consistent because it's a sphere but all I have to do is put some kind of stupid thing on the sphere and I will make this gravity more than you know this gravity because there'll be more mass this way uh, I've sort of made this point with uh, you know what you get out of um, the gravity profile of galaxies because they are flat you know generally speaking <laughs> you know um, that their gravity here to here you know for the lens the purpose of, of gravitational lensing the re another reason why it's a horseshit theory is they always show <coughs> galaxies this way so you have this swirly galaxy and they have some assumption that there's being lensing out here and out here so this light is being converged even though the lens is the wrong shape completely opposite can't create a focus here not possible because there's more gravity here than there is out here it's the opposite of a magnifying lens can't collect light and you know can't collect more light and focus it okay it's wrong shape lens but besides that the logic here is kind of silly if we're going to see gravitational lensing we should see it here and here because this is where the density of the mass is in the galaxy we got more mass here okay even though there is no real hard center I mean it's the swirly bits the gravity in in is so obvious in galaxies the gravity is here and here it's in these two arms these two arms are swinging around each other they're not swinging around a center they're swinging around the mass in the arms um, but anyway the fact is is there's still going to be more mass here in in the in this part than there will be in this part of the galaxy so the further out you go the less uh, mass there is so there's more mass here so lensing if it was going to take place there'd be much higher gravity at this location and this location so if we were going to lens light with a galaxy we would lens it across the flat part because you're getting gravity not only from this heavier mass but from all of this stuff and it's much closer you know, to the mass this is really far from most of the most of the mass is really far from out here and out here so you get much less gravity this is the weakest gravity of the galaxy this is the strongest and they never illustrate it that way these are just facts sorry I mean really sorry to disturb you with the facts <laughs> yeah um, anyway all right so why do objects fall towards a larger object with a consistent predictable speed and acceleration well the, the point is is it's all about how many how much mass you have and again it's it's consistent only because the shape of the object becomes consistent um, and that's it and that's because of the inverse square law and the fact that you're creating pressure the object is pressurizing and it's it's equalizing because all these little atoms are connected to each other it's equalizing the pressure which is creating the surface the round surface all right <coughs> I mean I think regular physics admits that there's a little bit more gravity on the equator than there are on the poles because there's more mass across the equator so the effect of gravity is being demonstrated to be something that has to go across that diameter it has to go across the diameter the, the whole diameter from me to the Fujian below me the, the, the effect of gravity has to travel that entire distance that is it has to hit atoms the density of the atoms for that entire distance and if I make that distance greater then I'm going to hit more 
of this force and therefore create more shadow. So again, we're back to the shadow argument and opacity. So the mass is the opacity. You can understand that if you had a dirty piece of glass, right? I mean, if you had a, a dirty piece of glass, uh, logically, and you wanted to figure out, well, <laughs> this is real complicated, right? You have a dirty piece of glass. Well, if I want to get the most light out of the glass, which way do I shine the light? Do I shine it this way? Or do I shine it this way? And, and you're saying, well, that's a complex question. No, you know that the light shining through the less opaque, because it's got to hit more dirt, it's going to hit more dirt. This is going to be a bigger, darker shadow here than is going to be over here. This is going to be a weak uh, shadow. This is going to be the, the, the deep, dark, black shadow. You can figure that out, right? Idiot, asshole, moron. Sorry, it's just these people are just so fucking annoying, <laughs> so rude. Um, they can't even try to follow along. Like I said, even when you you make it for kindergartners, and, and they pretend they didn't hear the words, they didn't hear the explanation. I mean, fuck you, asshole. Uh, so that's enough of that. Yeah, I like to talk to the modern mystic mistake. Waste of that waste of my time. Computers are made of silicon, etc. rocks. So again, computers don't feel, number one. That's the biggest one. <laughs> right? The really big one. Um, and of course they're still doing something much more complex than a rock. So the idea is, is he's basically saying that, um, see we're like a loaded spring, a very complex device. And you take this complex device and you take a rock and you throw them off a cliff and they bounce their way down. Well, sure, they're both going to do the same thing in the sense that they're both just going to bounce based on what they hit and blah, 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 and it's just going to be a mechanical process. But the springy thing, the Super Bowl, let's just say a Super Bowl and a cannonball. The Super Bowl has all kinds of arrangement and, and intricacy. Now, if we were going to say, let's throw a computer off a cliff and let's throw a rock off a cliff, you could say who cares, right? I mean, obviously we think computers, it's like, oh, why are you wasting a thousand dollar computer? So let's just say it's a shitty computer. All right. You know, it's, it's, it's a really old one, cart screen, really small, you know, 186 or something terrible, you know, yeah. and you throw them off the cliff. Well, who cares? Yes, they're going to, they're going to both do rock things because there's nothing going to happen. Okay. I mean, the computer will bounce differently. Say, say you give the computer a program where it says, I try to bounce off rocks, I try to, I turn when I'm going to hit this and I do this and I do that. So it's going to bounce a little funky and different. That's a fact, okay? The smart thing will fall different than the dumb thing. It's just a fact. But even a bigger fact is, <laughs> okay, is that if I did that with a sentient organism, you know it has consequence because it's going to feel. And to pretend that doesn't mean anything, that that's just like a rock. Rocks are just like people and it just doesn't matter whether you throw people off the cliff or you throw rocks off the cliff. Same thing, just the same consequence. And you're just pretending the ouch thing doesn't mean anything. You think it's just saying the word ouch, right? I can make a computer that says ouch every time it hits a rock and so, oh, that'll look a little bit like a, like a, a person being thrown off the cliff, right? And I could put a, you know, a silicone shell around it that looked human and I can make it look like it's having a trauma. But we know that the real trauma is the real trauma. The real event is our consciousness producing this value crap that's happening to us, this good and bad feeling. Um, and that's what makes it a ludicrous comparison. I mean, it's still stupid to say, the computer and the rock, you know, the computer that bounces off, you know, as it goes down, is the same thing. Well, they're not the same thing. And it's even more preposterous when you say the human and the rock is the same thing when I throw them down a cliff. And clearly, let's see, even make it more complex and say the, the human can learn. So the more times you throw it off the cliff, it learns how to bounce even fancier each time it goes down. And so eventually it can be very, very clever in how it bounces 
you know, very intricate. It could take years to bounce down the cliff where the rock just falls. The computer could figure out how to do it so gracefully that he just bounces, bounces, bounces so gently and he gets right to the bottom and he can just walk away. So the computer can walk away from falling off the cliff where the rock can never do that. It'll never, ever, 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 okay, in a zillion years, ever be able to go down the cliff without smashing at the bottom. I mean, it's just a, it's, it's <laughs> like I said, it's, it's, it's beneath our dignity to have to sit there just because this asshole wants to make some point about we don't have free will. Of course, we don't have free will. Yes, it's a deterministic universe. Yes, it's made out of little fucking bits moving around by very strict laws. There's just no room for any magic at all. All right? Yeah, that's the fact. That doesn't mean we're fucking rocks. Ugh, just so fucking irritating. And it's just for the purpose of nihilism. It's just for the purpose to evade having to take any responsibility for, for the fact that there's a huge amount of value at jeopardy in this fucking goddamn syndrome of consciousness, and none of these assholes want to take any responsibility for any part of it. They're here experiencing it, and they're still rejecting its existence. It's just so fucking idiotic. <sighs> they know there's a huge fucking difference between me sticking a fucking nail in their goddamn eye and me handing them a lovely cupcake. They know that's a different thing, and yet they're pretending it's not. Oh, it just pisses me off. Stupid fucking bullshit. Alright. So there really weren't any other comment. Um, uh, if you ever need a <laughs> German or... Serbian translator. It's really cool that you can speak all that crap. Uh, and yes, it would probably come in handy if I was more organized because some things do need to be translated, but I don't, I don't, you know. You can get the translations of some of these videos, but I guess it's just better to translate what I write, and so eventually I have to write it well enough that you can translate it. Uh, but maybe we'll get to that. Um, Okay, so this is all really just hostile day stuff, so I don't want to be bothered with that. I mean, not that I don't want to be bothered, but it's, you know, it's just it's, it's, it's said all that needs I need to say. Uh, so anyway, um, so maybe we'll leave it at that. I mean, uh, uh, there's, there's, there's lots of subjects to talk about, um, so, so I'll do a little bit on momentum. Um... So there's this idea. Uh, I was watching an Einstein video. Actually, I wanted to play some of it, but it's it's one of these dramatizations, you know. And there's so much time wasted and all that crap. So they did a little bit though on this, um, you know, a French woman. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, anyway, who you know did a uh, was a bit of a scientist <laughs> in her leisure. Um, well, anyway, this idea that. Um, uh, you know, if you drop two objects uh, from a distance, uh, you know, the the object will have a certain momentum when it hits, okay? And that the momentum is, in, is going to be its mass times its velocity squared, okay? So the idea is, is it's um, this squared part, that if I double the distance I drop it from, I don't just double the force that ends up hitting, I quadruple, you know, it's that 4x thing, so we're back to this, what the square means, and the square just means that 4x thing, it's four times as much, not twice as much, so if I double one thing, I end up with four times as much, and as I've sort of attempted to explain, you can simply understand part of that mechanism um, in understanding how electrons and protons gain their momentum. So again, I, as I pointed out in the last video, you have, we have, I grew up with this idea that you just bang something into something, right? Something moves, it hits something, and somehow by hitting it, this thing now has move. You know, it acquired move. And I didn't really think about, well, how does it acquire move? Like, what is the real difference between the wrench and space kind of thing? I have a wrench uh, in space, and I don't throw it. And I have a wrench that I do throw into space, okay? So this one all of a sudden has this thing called velocity, because I threw it, and this one doesn't. 
Now, what's the difference? Are those two wrenches different in some way? And the idea is, is I never really thought so. But, no, they are fundamentally different. This one's had its atoms changed, okay, by the act of acceleration. I have changed this one into something that has movement because its atoms are moving. It's not moving because the wrench is moving. It's moving because the atoms inside of it are moving. The electrons and the protons are moving. That's what's moving. So it's not the wrench. It's not the atom. It's the electrons and the protons that somehow keep going that way. <laughs> so, and the idea is just kind of simple. So instead of thinking about force hitting something, okay, and bouncing off and making this move, you know, and the funny part is, is if, they, if the regular conventional physics thinks if that happens, then nothing happens here. That somehow this thing has to move, stop, and this thing has to go. Now, that's the outward appearance, but it's not the inward mechanism. So the difference would be is this simple difference in understanding. It's understanding that the momentum of the force doesn't bounce off of something. It goes into the something, and the something gives back something else as the reflection. So the reflection isn't this stopping. It's this going in and giving back something that maybe will be stopped, okay, but most likely will not be. So, and then what's the consequence to this thing? So this thing has to have storage if it's going to give back something. It had to have it originally so that this electron is really full of stuff. It's full of its history. What happened just a second ago is right in here because something jumped in and something left. And then something jumped in and something left. So it's giving away what happened a second ago, let's say. It's a one second. We'll just make that up. All right, so every one second, the history is different than the previous second in the fact that we have different jumping ins and jumping out. So it's giving away the, the oldest piece and replacing, it's essentially replacing the oldest piece, all right? So, so um, you could go by oldest, or I think more rationally, you go by opposite, but it doesn't matter. So you could just think you have these registers and they're storing what's happening. So if this comes in, this is stored in here. And it's going to give away what happened. So this happened, so just think of it as a clock. You know, this happened, one, two, three, four, you know. So it just gives away the oldest thing, okay? So it took this, this becomes the, a new thing. And it gave, it, it gave back what, well, I should just draw it as that event. So here's the seats. So this seat was the last seat to be just changed. This was the one before it, the one before it, one before it, one before it. So this is the oldest seat. This has the oldest event. The, this guy jumps into that seat and he gives back whatever the, the oldest event was. So the oldest event could have been this. The oldest event could have been that. It could have been all kinds of things. And so if you understand that that's what's really happening. So something's going in. Something's coming out that looks like an opposite reaction. And, but the key thing that's happening is, is this disposition in here is changing. And it changes twice as much, the square. Okay, So you can sort of understand that if you had arrows um, going uh, this way, all right, stored in something. All right. and, <clears throat> and so you come in and say, I'm going to replace one of those right you could sort of understand that you're taking away one of those and you're replacing it with one of these and that's a doubling of the effect in the sense that you've made it move slower this way and you're moving it faster that way so every time you do this exchange you multiply the effect in the sense that now if I do it again then I'm going to have two going this way. And, uh, well, I'll leave that alone. Um, and now only two are going this way. So I've made it even slower this way, and I've made it even faster this way. So I've doubled the imbalance. And that's why the momentum is four times as much, is because while you're 
accelerating something, okay, that's this process of changing it, the acceleration process, once it takes place and creates a velocity, it's really creating twice as much momentum in the sense that it's now much easier to go this way because you're dragging along less of this. You've got to fight with less of this. So the more this I add, I end up with a bias of three, going this way and one. You can just see how the midget gets smaller and smaller <laughs> so fast, you know, right? who you're fighting. You know, you're getting bigger while he's getting smaller. So it's like the, you're getting every bit of food you're eating has to come out of the other guy's pocket, so to speak. So maybe money would be a better way to look at it. You're getting richer, he's getting poorer. You're not getting the you're not getting the money from the field, so to speak. You're actually taking it from his pocket, in theory. So, you no, know, he's getting smaller, you're getting bigger, and that's the square part. All right, I wasn't perfectly done, but. Um, and you can sort of understand that the key to that, though, is is that the acceleration part gets harder and harder. I mean, once you once you take this thing, and let's understand that. Okay, so once you change this object into something that has a lot of things going this way, and but it still has one going, let's say that way, the odds of being able to hit that become smaller and smaller, and so you you're applying a new force. Well, you can't make this go this way. It's already going that way. So hitting that won't help you. Hitting that won't help you. Hitting that won't help you. Hitting that. So hitting this one little last bit that's left, it gets harder and harder to hit it. Now they call that mass increase. They think because you're, because it it gets harder to push something, as it's going faster in a direction, they think that's because this is getting heavy. No, it didn't get heavy. It's getting lighter, in the sense that it's really hard to make this force hit anything. So when you're applying more, when the thing's going really fast, it just means that all the little bits are already going the same way you're going at the same speed you're going. And the only bits, there's very few of these now left, these ones going the wrong way, you've turned them into a tiny, tiny little midgets. And they're, t they're tiny things to hit now. They've gotten so small you can't hit them. So even though you're big, you can't hit them. Uh, and so even no matter how much force you throw at it, there's a point where the odds of hitting this this little bit is getting so small um, that yes, you have to throw so many rocks to try to hit that one little tiny bit of space in the ocean kind of thing. Um, and so it just seems like it's harder to push because it's heavier. No, it's hard to push because there's less of it to hit because it's really, most of it's m <laughs> moving away from you. And it's just a fact. So anyway, all this stuff can be explained rationally. You don't need to, to create bent dimensions and all that other crap. Um, all the Einstein nonsense is a misinterpretation of the actual effect. All right, that's probably enough. I mean, I could do, yeah, you know. E equals mc squared thing and just ex well, I'll do that one quick what the hell so um, what I have proposed now this is a little more draft but it's, I think it's on it's it's the right answer so the point is is that um, nuclei standard nucleuses the protons are preposterously close to each other now the electrons are the negative charge Okay, and, and we know they're so far. This distance is an insane amount of distance compared to the distance between the protons. I mean, it's a, a, a billion times difference. So this is a billion times closer than the electron is to the proton. And it's the same amount of charge, right? I mean, repulsive charge is the same force as attractive charge. So somehow this electron is still attracted at this preposterous distance. The force is strong enough to keep that attraction. And yet this repulsive force um, is just as strong, except somehow it's not working. So this should be an insane amount of force if you understand that this is still attached to this from that huge distance. This thing should be, these things should be so far away from each other. And the key, as I've pointed out, is, is that they're not because of the existence of electron between them. And the electron is basically just deflecting all the force. 
okay? It's allowing all this reflective force to escape. So the protons can't hate each other because they can't see each other, essentially. Right? <laughs> they don't know. The, the electron creates a little funky mirror here that just pre 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 prevents these two protons from knowing the other guy is there. And so the key is, is that in these uranium nucleuses or anything else, you know, when you, you, know, when you break this, these atoms, these nucleuses, what you're really doing is breaking the bond between the protons somewhere and that is creating this huge expansion so when this nucleus changes into two smaller nucleuses they're going to be expanded in size they're going to be a lot bigger okay so they're going to have the same components but they're going to be a lot bigger because they've lost this some of this mirror some of this tricky mirror that didn't make them able to see each other and so that's the real thing that's expanding is now you're letting more of the force back in between the protons and the protons are going to you know um, and when they all the other atoms have to move out of the way and so it just jolts everything and that's the pressure that moves from atom to atom to atom to atom and then that pressure ends up you know that force ends up breaking the other atoms too they end up getting broken by the very fact that this thing expands so quick and it pushes on them and breaks their nucleus. So, but anyway, it's kind of a simplification, but the point is is that it's it's the release of the low pressure. It's an expansion. It's just that simple. Um, created by this circumstance of this electron and proton being so close to each other. I mean, the, elect the protons being artificially close to each other. And once the regular field gets between them, it creates a huge expansion because the reflective mirrors start working again. See, the protons naturally have a whole bunch of energy bouncing between them. And when the electron's there, it dissipates all that. Get rid of the electron, and then the two protons say, I hate you. <laughs> so when the two barium atoms are created, you could argue, right? So you're taking one nucleus and you're turning it into two. Well, when you create the two nucleuses, the two nucleuses hate each other. The protons are saying, I should no way be this close to this asshole. And they're the things that are shooting fast away from each other. And that just creates a tremendous amount of energy in the sense that it creates a lot of vibration power, about power to move the other atoms. So it just heats it up in a sense. Yeah, that's probably a way to say it. So it's not so much it has to dissipate a bunch of little bits of radiation. The little bits of radiation are a consequence of the barium nuclei separating at incredible speed and smashing into other atoms and bashing little bits off. So little bits are a consequence, not the source of the, um, the real event. The real event is the two new nucleuses can't be this close to each other because they're covered in protons and they're just going to jet away from each other. So when you break a nucleus, the two pieces hate each other passionately. Alright, anyway. Yeah, that's probably the best way to say it. Best way to sum it up. It's just a, you know, a sp <laughs> well, you know, atoms are simple. I mean, it is a simplification, but it really is probably fairly simple. Anyway, until next time and such. And so forth and whatnot. Yeah, disappointing. That's all you can say. The commentary is just so pitiful. Again, I, I, I open challenge to anyone who wants to defend conventional physics in a live room. I'm available. Just email. My email address is in the description. Um, I'll pay you if you're reasonably qualified to have an opinion for the privilege of being able to interrogate you, ask you a few questions about your physics and why you have such confidence in it. And if you're really kind of an important physicist, I'll even pay you more. <laughs> okay? So all you, you physicists, all you show physicists out there on the internet, if any of you are paying any attention, which of course you're not, 
um, instead, you know, unlike flat earthers, I'll pay you to attempt to debunk me. I'll pay you to attempt to ridicule my physics. Because put on the line, putting our reputations on the line, I have no fear of you. You're going to lose the argument. And you're going to lose it big. So, um, again, what else can I say? I'm offering to pay them to attempt to debunk me. Unlike the flat earthers, they're not paying. The flat earthers aren't paying you to, to, to make fools out of them. I'll pay you to try, you pussies. <laughs> Jesus. In a public way. You know, like, put your physics on the line. Put your reputation on the line. Put your integrity on the line. And I'll pay you 